lot too. Can everybody hear me? Interesting to hear. Uh, so thanks for having me, having uh, us present here today. And, uh, I'm Randy Young. I teach at Calvin College, and um, my association with Summers Edge goes way back. Um, have you ever heard of the, the phrase, history repeats itself? It's kind of ha happened this past summer. Um, that, as Ron mentioned, uh, was 24 years ago. I was a student working with Harvey Blankens for um, Calvin is a rival of hope, but I still took, I seize the opportunity to work with Harvey and, and with Ron too. And uh, here, here we are, 24 years later, at Higgins Lake this summer, uh, working on Swimmer's Itch. So a distinct pleasure to work with Harvey once again. And um, I want to introduce other members of our team. Uh, all, have, all happen to be uh, university professors. Um, the slide is actually because I've transferred to Mac. It's like some of the fonts here are being messed up here. But uh, Dave Jude is a linologist, fisheries ecologist from the University of Michigan on the left here. And uh, then Harleen next to him, and then me, um, and then Kurt Langsport. And then, not pictured in the organza fruit catching picture there, uh, Dr. Ren Tuberigan, who's an engineer at Calvin uh, with, with me, and uh, turned out he's a pretty good biologist too. So we had, um, he helped catch broods, um, just not this one, but where we're all pictured. And his, his role as an engineer uh, came in in designing or helping us improve the trap that we've been using and um, catching organza seeds. So, um, this is an image of, of two parasites underneath the skin. Okay, and this is actually um, was related to the discussion. We're just having a table over here. Um, what's happened? How do you get swimmer's itch? And um, as Ron mentioned, the security are coming from the snails and they are in search of a host duck that they inadvertently um, burrow into, into human skin. and. He, they die there, fortunately, right? They, fortunately, they die there, and the papules that we see are your body's immune reaction to the dead parasite. And um, we don't think that the immune system is what kills them. It's probably that they are maladapted to humans, they're adapted to ducks, and they're not getting any further than this first, first level of penetration that, that they're able to do. And then, of course, you get, yeah, you get more than two. It's pretty, pretty miserable, right? Uh, Ron reviewed this, so I'm trying not to spend too much time, but there's a couple of points I want to make was looking at the life cycle of the parasite. And, um, but we can just, just uh, review that there's an adult worm that lives in a vertebrate host, eggs that exit with the feces. And we were just talking about how that happens. No one really knows uh, because it's not like the worms are inside the intestine laying eggs continuously. They're laying eggs outside the intestine and blood vessels, and somehow the leg, the eggs get into the lumen of the intestine. Um, same with human schistosomes in Africa. It's not known exactly that it happens. Except for um, the eggs, it is known that the eggs co-opt to degree the immune system and somehow amazingly, magically get inside the, uh, the, the interior of the intestine. When that egg hits the water, it hatches very quickly and goes in search of a snail, um, Mericidium, and then once they find a snail, sporocysts develop. 30 days of development occurs in the snail, and then the snail will start shedding uh, Sercari. And the Sercari are um, live a day and are in search of a vertebrate host, a duck host in the case of the Higgins' zones. But bump into us, and we're a dead end, dead end host. Okay. Um, as was mentioned, back in 1983, the culprit was found to be Trichopithecus technically, which uses mergansers as the main host, and technically snails, or snail hosts. Um, and I think this came up in the previous presentation that. This is something that is common to the five books that have been looked at so far, but is not, not something we can assume is universal. And in 
fact, uh, in 2002, Kurt did some work on Lake Mitchell, uh, where the this was not confirmed with DNA sequence as we would today, but the, the parasite with Trichocarpsia ocellata and uh, mallards and cannon geese appear to be playing a role in the life cycle there. And the snail host was different as well. So it's a, it's, here's an example of where the assumptions um, are not necessarily the same for every lake. So, um, in 2015, as was mentioned, Higgins Lake was kind of leading the way and partnered with um, the White Spores and, um, and to do some work. And um, they entered into a three-year science-based comprehensive program. And by comprehensive, um, sorry about the font, this is a switch over. Um, to first, as we mentioned, look at the uh, what species is going up, is, is cycling in the lake. Okay, as I mentioned, that's a very important step that any new lake might, will want to do. They also want to do bird control, find nests, and trap roots. Educational activities and outreach are often an important part of this process. Um, holding open houses, informing the public answering questions where they need to be answered. And also assess the, the, the program, how it's doing in terms of snail infection rates. To see whether that is effective. And at Higgins Lake, as I mentioned, uh, trichomycosis is technically in organzers and stagnant with snails was found to be the culprit. And although um, that was Assumed to be the case going in, it was still checked. A very important step um, in 2015 to do. Uh, in terms of snail uh, collections, uh, a very important part of the program was assessing the success of the program. And right in 2015, we wanted to get a, uh, a baseline set of data as to what the snail infection rates are before control begins. And 10 sites on Higgins Lake were selected, and uh, snails were collected multiple times throughout the summer. And these results were confirmed, the idea that Higgins Lake had a problem in terms of summer's edge. People were reporting lots of summer's edge, and the data were confirming that. So the way um, these, these data have been organized is to by cover, so you you can pay attention to most of the colors. And the scale on the right, it's, this is an arbitrary scale. There's no, nothing in the literature, in the literature to um, say it's actually what it has to be. But uh, let's just say that below 0.24% is ideal, tolerable up to 0.49, moderate up to 0.9%, severe 1 to 2%, and epidemic above 2%. So you can see um, that we're never dealing with very large percentages. Uh, even on lakes that have a very, very uh, severe some of problem. And um, if we use those categories, you can see there's an awful lot of red here that Higgins Lake had a problem. Most locations had, uh, had percentages that were above 2%. And about, um, you know, that, that, um, about eight to 10,000 snails were collected and the overall percentage was about 3.01%. It's quite high um, for our, by our experience. Hey, Randy? Yeah. Go back one slide. So what was the Yacht Club doing? Yeah, that is an a outlier there. Um, and this is a case where uh, we don't know. Maybe it, it's a, it's a, we, they, they could have been spraying copper, copper sulfate. We don't know that. Not to my knowledge. Anyway. Is that the yacht club on the island? That's on the island. Yeah, it's on the island. And uh, one thing we do know is that's a very <coughs> it's a that's a snail bed with very high density. So it could be that uh, in terms of the numbers of snails infected there, it's similar to other coastlines. Just as a percentage of snails, it's low. We don't. Know. Um, but it, it's a little bit of an outlier. Any other questions about that data? 
So that's the baseline, baseline data. And um, the, in 2015, there, a lot was known about common organisms through Ron's work and Harvey's work um, in the past, including that they are calving nesters and nest prospectors. Um, they go in search, as Ron showed, and uh, the significant, uh, significant part of their energy budget, I would think, in the year before they breed and as they return in the year that they're going to breed. Uh, they're looking for these nest cavities. They lay eggs in uh, early spring, April, May, incubate, and by the very end of May or the beginning of June, we'll start to see broods appearing and we'll continue in July or maybe now August. <laughs> And the, uh, if left to their own devices, hens and ducklings are going to return to their um, natal site, to the place that they're hatching. Um, one thing that was known from their work is that ducklings very quickly seem to get infected and uh, are passing the parasite in their feces by four to five weeks of age. And that's pretty fast, um, given that if you, if you infect ducks, not regans, there's no way raising their answers in the lab. But in fact, ducks in the lab, it takes about 28, 30 days for the parasite to develop. So that means on, on many lakes, probably these birds are getting infected the first day they're out on the water. Um, and so they're getting infected, and within a month, they're, they're passing parasites. And uh, their work shows, this is very critical, that ducklings are infected at a level 10 to 100 times that of their parents. So this is why uh, brood, brood removal is such a crucial part of control of things. All right. So um, <coughs> catching regandrs is not easy. Uh, as Ron mentioned uh, way back in, when when it started, no one knew how to catch them. Joe Johnson, even who I worked with later, actually. Um, didn't know at that time how to catch them, so it took a lot of effort to figure that out. Um, part, part of the reason is that they eat fish, they don't eat bread, they don't walk up to your toenails and peck your toenails, that's not true. Um, and uh, so you can't, you can't bake them. You can't give them something in their food to get rid of the parasite. Um, and they eat live fish, that they don't eat. Fish. They're very wary, they're very visually oriented, uh, they're predators, um, so they're, they're, they have keen eyesight, um, they, they, they also you know, have a lookout for any, any, anything they might try on them. So you can't get very close to them, they don't like people. Um, if you've seen them, you, you can, you've probably have seen that behavior, they're not like an they're secretive, they, they tend to find the places where there are the least people and least activity on the lake. And we overall we know very little about their biology. Uh, talking to an ornithologist in my department, he, he said, yeah, I don't know that much about regansers at all. Uh, and I don't think there is much known. And they're smart, as, as uh, Harvey, Ron, and crew would say. They're smart. They, they seem to learn when lake was harder to trap on to the, this year because of, of harassment. They get more and more wary. Uh, Hardy even would swear that they recognize their <laughs> boat and truck. And uh, I can testify that this summer on Crystal Lake, uh, there were two uh, hatchery birds that had seen us before. I've never seen birds run like that before. When we saw them a month later, they just took off running and ran and ran and ran and ran, and ran until we exhausted them. Um, they did not like to see us. <coughs> All right, so um, in 2015, the control efforts and uh, capture and relocation efforts resulted in nine broods, 88 total birds being removed from Hagen's Lake. So COMB, I should just mention this, is, stands for Common Regainser. And then in 2016, uh, Crystal Lake started a bridge program, uh, and by that, to get ready to enter into control, and Higgins Lake continued with their comprehensive control program, and uh, that would be year two. 
Um, in 2016, this bridge program identified that yes, in Crystal Lake, it's again tracked with hard seeds technically, and we're gansers, and stagnant with snails that are the culprit. So there was the same situations with Higgins Lake. Uh, again, 10 sites were selected for snail collection. And Crystal Lake, um, we were able to get baseline data from Crystal Lake. And you can see that um, here we have about 8,000 snails again, and there's not as much red. So the interesting thing about Crystal Lake is that the level of the snail infection levels are not as high as they were at Higgins Lake. Yet Crystal Lake had a significant enough problem that, uh, that they wanted help. Uh, but you can see there's not a lot of green there either, so it's kind of in between. The overall uh, snail, snail infection percentage here was 0.85%. <coughs> so about one third of that is All right, I mentioned that uh, part of the comprehensive program was to look for uh, common regenerative nests. And this is a video which, I don't know, yeah, I'm going to have to tap it here. Multiple female cancers. 
Well, what Ron's picture showed, it, it, uh, they were visiting, I, I assume there was more yeah. than one uh, female. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, that's, I guess that's somewhat of an open question, is uh, how, many, how many females contribute eggs to that nest? Right, and we do know they are they are known. Most cavity nesters in the bird world actually are um, do have individuals that you know the majority of eggs will be theirs, but then you have ones that are just egg dumpers, and maybe they're the less dominant females. To what degree this this happens, we, we just don't know. Um, we think genetics could perhaps answer that question. Yeah, and that would and go along with the further as they develop and form their crush. I think was the name of it. Yeah. Groupings, yeah, and one female will take over the whole swarm. Yeah, um, you know, the, you do realize because of incubation period, there is one, there is one hen doing the, the hard work. You know, the ones that are egg dumping, they're just egg dumping, and then there's a hen that sits on, sits on. So whether that's the dominant hen, we don't, we don't know. <laughs> All right, so. This is um, a shot of the birds in our trap making a road trip to Tawas, which is the uh, location of the relocation site for Higgins Lake. And they seem to uh, tolerate that trip uh, quite well. We, we take care to make sure they don't get overheated. And we also, um, DNR works with us to, to make sure they're minimizing the amount of time these birds are handled. Uh, but, um, you know, they make that trip and then we release them. And we, if, uh, when we catch them on, which is usually the case, oh, this is not the video, okay. So um, there's a video coming up for it with release. But we release that mom, we let the chicks go, and then release the mom and she'll gather them and, and uh, lead them into their, their new home. Uh, in 2016, the, this was done six times at Higgins Lake, six broods, 47 total birds. And in 2016, there's also a snail assessment program going on, and you can see that the colors have generally changed. Pretty big difference. Um, the, the overall infection rate is now down to about 0.25%. And just as a contrast, that's last, that was 2015. This is 2014. So you can see when you start to have some measure of effect, uh, that that eight to ten thousand snails is the number you got to be at in order to see that, that difference. Okay. Um, so it is uh, does involve some, quite a bit of work. Were you collecting the? Uh, Birds throughout the lake. I thought there was a problem that you could only collect it in half the lake. Not as far as our relocation program. That, that was a the harassment program was affected by that, by those decisions. Yeah. Is that program still ongoing? The or harassment that? program? Yes. Uh, it was occurring this year too, but to it less. seemed quite minimal <coughs> yeah. um, compared to the two prior years. Uh, we only noticed maybe a jet ski out every once in a while and there was no lethal take at all. So the, the competing program was very minimal this year. Okay. On to 2017, uh, Crystal joined in as the brood, in the brood removal program, encouraged by the results from Higgins Lake. So uh, again, I think we've benefited from Higgins Lake, and um, you know, this is a, um, hopefully these adults will encourage you, just like uh, <coughs> Crystal Lake. Higgins Lake is in the third year of its control program this year. And again, uh, we'll continue to look at um, nest site location. This is, and we did this at Crystal as well. There's a bird flying in. And then, same tree, a couple days later, bird flying out. There she goes. 
Um, to my knowledge, we did not observe as much as what Ron talked about, st the stacking of burnt hens at the, at the nest sites. Um, but it, you know, it could be going on. Uh, at Crystal Lake, then, we had a little bit of a surprise, actually. Um, in, the, in, in the bridge program, we did a couple bird surveys, and both times, there were five birds on the lake. So, when we started this year's control program, we thought, oh, five or six birds? That, that, that's probably what our work is going to be. We had 14. 14 broods. 126 total birds. So that was a little bit unexpected. And I think shows that these are biological species. These are populations that are changing. They're, um, and we can't always predict how they're going to change. And it contributes to uh, why some of the ditch probably at certain times goes up and certain times goes down. Uh, here with Kerr is a, is a student of his um, from last summer who came for a day. She's a pre-vet student was actually thrilled to, to, to join us just for, day, for the day. I told her when you go to vet school, you're going to be the only student that's handled the answers. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, I may have missed something, but can you clarify, do you find 14 broods? We, we trapped and relocated 14 okay. broods. So, where did you yes. relocate? We trapped and relocated for 14 broods. And where was the relocation? So um, on, on Crystal Lake, they go to Sutton's Bay area, and we have a few sites that we, or a couple of sites that we divvy up the birds. Uh, but as uh, earlier today, Rob Carner was saying we'd like more. And so the plan is to get, get more, more sites. Can I ask a follow-up? I'm sorry that I arrived late. Are they inland lakes in Sutton's Bay area, or is No, it's only the big lakes. Okay. So, um, an important point is that we have been uh, bringing them to places where we know that the snail uh, populations are absent or at least non-detectable, and um, places historically that do not see swimmer's itch, big lakes generally. And the reason that the big lakes do not have swimmer's itch or the right snails uh, is that the wave action appears to be detrimental. Um, in fact, these these sites have very few snails at all, let alone the right species of snails. Thank you. Yeah. So did you trap uh, all birds on Crystal Lake? Were there any left behind? We do not believe there were any left behind. How did you, like, how do you know that for sure you got them all? Yeah. So usually we, um, you know, ideally <coughs> we want to do a brood survey where we don't, after all the tracking's been done, a bird survey should say, and you don't see any bird answers. So you did a bird survey after all the yeah. 14 birds? Yeah, after all 14. So. And what we, was, we were was getting uh, reports of sightings of birds yeah. uh, from the parents that were calling that in for, um, up to that point in time. Once they took the last brood off, we didn't get any of them. But my, my yeah. point is, based on Ron's anomaly of an August brood, one would have thought that your last survey would have been in mid-July after doing your 14 birds and 26 chicks, and then you think you're yeah, all good. Yeah, we were out there um, until the very end of July. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so it's as of so the end but, of July. But now maybe, maybe we need to double check in August. It's true. Right. Yeah, but I think in terms of what Ted said, we have such an active reporting community on this lake. Yeah. That if, if they had been showing up in August, you would have seen them. Chad or Joel or somebody yeah. uh, would, have, would have heard uh, somebody yeah. on the report. That, yeah, that was true at Higgins, too. We had, yeah. I mean, people saw them or dancers. Um, they didn't take long for a call. They were right there. Multiple calls. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. Right. The alert yeah. system is quite good. Once people get familiar with what's going on in the lake, you, they, the Mergandus don't have as much chance to. Uh, <coughs> yeah. I mean, that we. Um, and I will just remark on the, the rather substantial highlights where I was not doing some of the research. Um, I, I, when I did work 24 years ago, it was Higgins Lake. And the difference between then and now, in terms of people's education and knowledge and ability to identify their answers, it's way different. It's a whole different ballgame. So that lake uh, 
association and riparian involvement is really, really critical. Yeah. Do mergansers collect more than once a year? Do mergansers what? Uh, lay a lay a batch of No, they're not known to lay more than one. Uh, and waterfowl in general um, do not. Mallards will, yeah. but most waterfowl um, one nesting attempt and they're done. And are they present as mating pairs according to many rules? Ah, good question. So the uh, you will see them as pairs in the early spring when the when the uh, mom is laying eggs, and then um, you know she'll go and lay an egg, or she'll come back, and hang out with her. Then when she gets to the business of incubating, because remember she lays eggs over, she lays one a day for a period of days, and then she incubates. It's like the male gets bored, says, "What am I here for? I'm only going to get, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to take off," and they do. Um, so. If you see males around, it means there's possibly still a pair, you know, still in the process of testing. Um, if, if they're, sometimes males will hang out on their own, but if they're with a female, that would indicate a pair. Yeah. Are there any distinguishing features between this, the male and the female that, that it's easy to pick up on? Yeah, the males are um, much more much more pleasant to look at. They're, they're flashing. We got the white. Um, white and black, and they've got green. Um, they're, they're they're very. Um, That's the male. Yeah, and the females are more drab, um, with the sort of cinnamon oh, brown head, gray gray and white body. Yeah. Are you banding each of those? Yeah. Yes, we're banding also. Yeah. We um, in fact this thing coming up here. No, this is a release. Here. And you'll see in this one um, something that I've never seen before happen, but they all they all got back together. So. Okay. They went around the truck. Oh, you can't. Wait. There they go. So for some reason, <laughs> and uh, for those of you that are less familiar, um, you know this this technique was pioneered way back with the Glen Lake project in 1983, and um, you know we've seen in all these projects we've seen good survival rates with uh, these mergansers. Um, we learned that. I think early on, Ron and Harvey learned that, hey, we want to make sure it's not too wavy where they're released, that they have some shelter. And, um, you know, we don't get reports of birds washing them on shore. They seem to survive. And they survive even without the mother. Um, these birds are what are called precocial. They come out of the nest, as you saw, and, you know, they, they flutter or parachute down, whatever they're doing. <laughs> And then they hit the water, and they're catching fish within a day or two on their own. They're amazing, amazing birds. It looked like several of the nests were quite a ways off shore. So did they prefer to find a, a, a hole near shore? You know, um, I think they that little period of time where they run from the, the nest to the to the shore is probably not, the distance is probably not as important to them as the site itself, I think. Because the, that time that they're in the tree hole, the mother's not there, you know, for most of the time the eggs are there, all, you know, unprotected. She incubates, she doesn't want to be preyed on when she's incubating. So I think the site itself is probably more important. That's why you see some of them, to, you know, away from the lake. Always. What would be a predator for the nesting? Yeah, I should climb the trees. Eat the eggs. Raccoons? Raccoons. Possums? How do they look in comparison to the males and females? 
the, the second year birds, uh, whether they are male or female, look like females. And um, so, you know, when, when, we, when we're watching birds scout for nests, or when you see them stacked up, <laughs> looking at nests, some of those may be third year birds, um, actually they're gonna lay eggs this year. Some of them <coughs> are second year birds, they're just learning the ropes, they're just you know, checking out nest sites, and they're not gonna reproduce until the following year. <coughs> and then, and then interesting, the interestingly, the males don't get their breeding plumage until their third year, um, or at the end of their second <coughs> class, and uh, they can look like they can look like females. Has anyone ever tried to uh, create a false nest or a track nest? Uh, yeah, um, they have. Um, the let's see, I'll, I'm gonna, I'll talk about that in a moment. Okay. <coughs> All right, hey, Randy. Yeah. Uh, just to, to follow up, um, Higgins Lake had a competing program, and they were given a uh, lethal control permit. So, for no scientific value, they were shooting for answers. Out of about 50 common regansers over the first two years that were shot, half of them turned out to be males. Because as a part of the, the one nice thing that was done is uh, the DNR required that the birds that were shot be turned over to Cycon for analysis. And so while they thought they were shooting females, and that, that was their metric, how many hens can we kill? turns out about half of them were actually males. And then we also did um, analysis of the infection rate, and about half of the birds were not infected, and um, few if any were uh, more than likely infected. So our view was for control purposes only, the lethal program was not very effective. We still, still believe that a scientific collector's permit where you can get some scientific value out of it is something that should continue, but we were pretty surprised at how ineffective the overall legal program was and, and misdirected in, in effect. Yeah, I, I knew that they had, they had to really shot some mail through this. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we also employed some drone work um, and for the, in the, in the uh, search for nest sites. And um, this is just a little video showing what. And they are amazing um, instruments. It's showing going out from, from the little island here at Haynes Lake. And then looking down on the operators. And you know the camera resolutions are just very, very high now. Uh, so they're very useful. And I think this excursion resulted in this image. So there was a cavity on the island. And this can be zoomed in. At. Uh, we didn't see any eggs in there, but it, it doesn't show that well here. But look, and maybe it's just us getting a little too um, regans are crazy. But the more we looked at it uh, on, a, on, a, on a computer screen, it, there is this little white thing here. It's possibly a regans are hen looking up at us, or up at the drone. Um, it, I'm not convinced by looking here. If you saw it on the screen, you, you might be convinced. <laughs> And other cavities that were found, um, but these were not used, okay? Um, and so we found cavities, but we didn't always find nests. Same as same Ron, confirmed nests are hard to find. Yes? Any particular um, tree type that you noticed as a prime candidate? Not that I know of, no. Just, you know, the cavity, I think its suitability is, is, they're looking at the physical.
physical nature of it. I mean, one of the things uh, that, that probably the hen is thinking about is can the young get out? Because uh, if you, if you, if you uh, people make, um, you know, nesting boxes for wood ducks or, or whatever, you know, the young have to be able to get out somehow. Um, so you got to put, you know, something for them to claw. Um, you know. So that's probably something that really Uh, we use a camera to try to verify some of these, these nests, and as I said, the, the ones that we found, we did not find eggs. And the only ones we did find were some nest boxes. So see the nest box up at the top there on the left? This is a nest box that we would prefer not be there, but it was there. And um, this is a... <coughs> A camera where we can see the image real real time in a in a phone, and we were able to see those were eggs indeed eggs laid in this nest box. So this is a used used box. Who knows that from a wood duck box? From a wood duck? Oh, that that may be in fact the same as a wood duck box. Oh, yeah. well, people are putting on wood duck boxes. They may have them for that reason. There was also um, the control effort to by the other group. On Higgins Lake to say, okay, and, and they, I don't know the details that well, but I, at one point they had permission to um, boil the eggs, I believe, and kill the eggs. Um, and then I don't remember the precise details here, but they, they, they weren't able to do that later. So. And you know, the, the issue there is you're just creating more spaces for them to nest in. Um, it's not, we're not certain that that's an efficient way to control them. When they found eggs in a nest, they would smash the eggs and kill the hens. So they, they were using it as a control method until it was subsequently stopped. Um, and that in this this uh, this nest nest box ended up being productive. We were able to go back and verify that all but one egg had hatched. And the, so this is one of the broods that we caught on Higgins Lake came from that nest box. Um, in terms of our trap, we um, our traps are quite are somewhat similar to Ron, but as I mentioned, we have an engineer that's an engineering student team that worked with us, and we have some. Um, variations on our trap, uh, one of which um, is, I going to play a short demo over here, it's a mechanized part of the trap that um, is remotely, oh my gosh, this is more formatting issues, but it goes up very fast, can pull up um, the net very fast as we are um, trying to trap. Uh, we also did web tags on the ducklings, so the, the hen receives a U.S. Fish and Wildlife ban, and the ducklings receive web tags. Uh, we're hoping that no, uh, as I mentioned, ducklings should um, or do, as far as known, and most, most uh, of the common organs of relatives are the same way. Wherever they are raised as ducklings, uh, that's where they return to. So. Um, one of the strong features of the relocation program is that ducklings that are relocated, you do not believe, come back to your lake. And web tags are uh, something we implemented this year to try to, to verify that. We should not see any web tag duck, ducks appearing uh, back at Bacon's Lake, Crystal Lake. And at two, in 2017, Bacon's Lake, you have four broods, 56 total birds. So one thing to note about Higgins Lake is that um, in three years, and it's only three years, so it could be we'll get a jump next year, but it does appear that possibly the number of broods is going down. Yeah, this kind of gets to where I'm, my thinking's been going is that the one letter that was sent by a woman asking for help on Higgins Lake, I think, in 2017, and 56 birds caused that problem. Is that true? 
I think that, um, that quote was from a different lake. I'm sorry? That quote was not from Higgins. That quote was not from Higgins. Like that's the quote that Ron had up? Yeah. yeah, that was Glen Lake. That was Glen Lake. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so review here. There's the, the data. The number of roots is going down. It, it's a little hard, you know, with all the things going on in Higgins Lake with two competing programs and a lethal program or as a program, it's, it's, it's a little hard to draw too much. Yeah, but the good news is it's going the right direction. Right, and, but theoretically, if if relocation results in ducklings that don't return to your lake, um, then you you expect over time the hens the hens die and the number of, of hens returning to your lake will go down. Um, that's not to say that hunter beganders don't occasionally go to another lake. And, you know, they just want to they want to get away from where they grew up, or if they want to, it's too crowded or whatever. Um, but you know, they are known as you know perinatal birds. And they return to the site of, of nesting, especially if they've been successful. And uh, ducklings, evidently, at some point in their life, learn where they were hatched, but we don't think it happens in those early days of life. It happens later, probably as they're getting ready to migrate. Oh, yes. Just a quick comment. Crystal and Higgins are almost identical in size. Um, first year, as you can see, we, Higgins did the trap we relocated. We had nine broods, 88 broods. Uh, so first year for us is this year. Um, we have 14 broods and 126. 126 right? So you can see how they've had that reduction over the last three years. They're down to four broods and 14 in the first year. So. And uh, one of these broods was crushed. So it really was uh, just three trapping events. I mean, there was two different sizes in one of the broods. In fact, that brood was a brood of 37, which is um, a record for Higgins Lake, right? But it's two, two broods crushed into one. Uh, so just a review, uh, or I'll, I'll just to continue the snail infection data, so what is 2017 telling us? This is 2015, as you've seen. 2016, it got better. In 2017, we collected over 8,000 snails, and we found four infected, four infected snails. So uh, overall, it's about a reduction of 50 fold. Um, and an interesting number, I happen to be talking to somebody at Higgins Lake, or uh, Higgins Lake Gathering, who works for the, I believe, the Roscommon County. She had tabulated, she, she said that she had once had records from three years ago, about 150 sheets of paper that recorded storm ditch incidences. And some of those were multiple people in the same day. So well over 150 people. This year, three. So about a 50-fold reduction in some residual cases, too, which is really interesting. All right, um, so additional challenges of catching common users. Um, really, it's the additional challenge of our program, and that is we don't really know the role of nest sites. And we sometimes have um, you know, individuals, for whatever reason, may put up nest boxes. So it can be that you're, you're trying to bail the water out of the boat, right? But people are putting holes in it, okay? They're putting, making it easier for common organisms to, to um, breed on your lake. So that's a continual challenge. Um, and uh, there are other challenges too, some things that might um, ameliorate those. Uh, why do they nest on some lakes and not others? In other words, we really need to know more about their, bi their biology. What are their requirements? Um, what determines the number of roots on a lake? Uh, one of Ron's questions was, does the nesting sites, do the nesting sites limit the number? Uh, that's still a lot of open question, I would say. How long does it take a hen to find a nest? You know, what's this relationship between the, the scouting that goes on in the second year and actually choosing the nest in that third year? How does that work? 
what happens if the nest is destroyed? What if we are able to identify nests and take interventional measures? Do they have a plan B? I don't think we have the answer to that. And the nest on a different lake, the lay eggs in the bushes or on the ground. And actually, um, the I should mention that in our in our trying to find nest sites and poking our camera into different nest sites. Besides that nest box, the only eggs we did find was one on the ground and one in the water. <coughs> for some reason. So they may at times lay eggs on the ground, we don't know. Um, that, that was after some nest boxes had been removed, so there was some yeah. suspicion that when the nest boxes got removed, the hens that otherwise would have laid their eggs in those nests had to dump their eggs. So they have, a, you know, they have a biological necessity to get rid of that egg, but it's coming, you know, or not. And whether they would choose to then incubate, it might just depend on the location. Maybe they're just going to abandon those eggs. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, the question, open question is, how long does it take the to imprint? Um, you know, how long, in other words, suppose that your lake, you know, a little given lake is trying to compress its duck catching time. Is it dangerous to leave them on the lake for a certain amount of time until they start to imprint before you've actually transported them to another lake? It's certainly possibly dangerous to uh, let them go too long in terms of summer's edge. But in terms of this question of whether they're going to come back, uh, we don't know when they actually learn. Uh, those would be good questions to know. So um, we have some <coughs> requirements in mind, and, and um, we'll answer some of these questions. We are looking to, to use GPS tags to locate nesting sites. Uh, these are these are tags similar to the geolocators, uh, but a little bit different, and um, could help us locate nesting sites, and, as well as eliminate a lot of biology about our answers. Uh, we see a need to look at QPCR. Um, we've done some QPCR as well, and we of course wanted the pattern and whatnot. But once the need we see is um, to correlate snail infection and QPCR with uh, those two. Since snail infection has historically been the way that the lake program is assessed, uh, what's the relationship? And um, QPCR is great for answering questions in the short term. Is it suitable or how is it best going to be suited to answer more long-term questions of year to year and so on? How do, how do, we, how do we optimize QPCR? for that. Uh, to do some common organic genetics um, or an ant with stable isotopes, we have some ongoing collaborations. And then uh, we also are working on and have uh, worked on some new common organic trapping techniques and that will continue. So just um, some acknowledgments. Lots of people on, sorry about the fonts, I guess. But um, first, some Crystal Lake folks, Mary and Jim Rogers at Chimney Corners, uh, graciously let us stay there many times when we were working at Crystal. And um, <coughs> now I'm trying to remember uh, Sue Brown's role. Um, <laughs> so I had an S. You had an S? Oh, okay, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Joe and Saskia uh, let us park our boat there since we were doing Higgins and Crystal. Um, we had quite, quite a, um, you know, logistical uh, <coughs> things to, to, to uh, consider there. Uh, Rick Lamer was the drone operator at Higgins. And David Kerr and Jordan gave us a, a place for our boat hoist for the summer. Bob and Ann Wagner hosted us in our lab. And uh, Ron Wiltz of Newcraft Metal Products was a uh, in, uh, business near Higgins Lake that donated some uh, materials for uh, one of our traps. So with that, um, thanks for having us, and I'll take questions. Yeah. It, this is a multifaceted question. You've got some organgers that are infected and some aren't. Now, is that genetics, or is that where yeah. you were swimming I, and you weren't getting snakes? Yeah, there's certainly, you certainly may find mergansers that are not, but in terms of those mergansers that are on that lake, 
um, you know, the ducklings of the year, they're nearly 100% of them. So I think, yes, it's possible that genetics of different common organisms may play a role, but it, even if that's the case, it's likely that the parasite that is the primary, you know, primary problem at a lake is probably genetically adapted to both the snails on that lake and to the lineage of organisms that's on that lake. Um, and, and, and overall, yeah, in migrant, in migrant mergansers, um, there's, you see more variability, but the ones that are the, the young of the year on that lake, you don't see so much variability. They're almost all in front. Yeah, I don't know if there's any information available on it, but do you have any that would give you some indication when, let's say, mergansers may recolonize certain areas that you Remove the organisms from. I mean, is this something that's going to be done every year, forever? Because they could. Yeah. Be uh, with like, like I think uh, we said, three years data doesn't show us how low it's going to go and how quickly it's going to go down to zero or one or whatever. And and I think I try to say that also. You, we, I'm sure organisms occasionally go to new lakes. Otherwise, they would only be on the same lakes for forever, right? But for the most part. They're coming back to the same. But at what rate they occasionally say, uh, let's try a new place, that's that's unknown. Yeah. And your your number of ten to hundred times more highly infected, is that literature or something that in terms of the you know, is that literature down or something Yeah, I think that is based on Ron and Harvey's work in the past. The ducklings were ten to hundred times have a higher, uh, uh, the intensity of the infection is 10 to 100 times that of the adults. Um, the, uh, the, there are data published that, that they were about 100% infected. I don't know if that intensity was in there or not, but it's, it's, it's been true every place in the park. actual number of concentration of parasites in the system. Yeah, yeah, so often you'll do a, you'll look at an adult bird and it's lightly infected, and then let's say the, the mom, and then the, the ducklings are medium to heavy infections, which is on our scale is, is about 100 times greater than the, than the mom. Does, so does that mean that the uh, the birds <coughs> develop a resistance to this infection over time, uh, we, or do they the, die if they're so heavily infected? No, we think that the, there's something perhaps about the duckling immune system that changes towards the end of the summer or in the fall, and then they're not as highly infected. There, there could be two things going on there. Maybe they're killing some worms and they have fewer worms, although um, maybe, it, or maybe it's that they're just more effective at suppressing reproductive output of those worms. <coughs> the immune system is onto them, and those worms are there surviving but producing fewer eggs. No one knows. And this heavy infestation uh, doesn't affect the health of the ducklings. It doesn't appear to. No. No. Yeah. I would think that the plumage is what's going on there because your adult mergansers have heavy plumage and water resistance, and the <coughs> ducklings have a lot of exposed skin. It seems just kind of yeah. sense that they would be have a problem. Yeah. If you're talking about continual reinfection, um, the ducklings are, are probably more susceptible. But it does appear that the ducklings get infected and then become less infected as they enter. As they get older. You know, because they get older. One of the studies we're looking at for this fall, but I'm not sure we're going to be able to get there because we haven't found a suitable site, is we do know a fair amount about the infection rate of ducks on Higgins Lake in the spring. And uh, because of the the 50 or so ducks that were turned over to Cyclone. We're kind of interested in seeing if there's a difference in the infection rate for the fly-throughs, and most of those would be fly-throughs. Is there a different infection rate for the fly-throughs in the fall? Um, have, have they, you know, we really don't know. We have some suspicion that um, the first-year ducks that fly through may be heavily infected. We're concerned about that because 
we spent all this time and effort in the summer relocating these ducks and, and keeping our lake pretty free and clear for gansers and, and infection. And then we have all these ducks coming at us in the fall, flying through for just a couple of days. We also have the benefit in the spring that the water is very cold, the snails are kind of sleepy and they're not very susceptible to infection. But we're worried about that fall period we haven't really come up with a good solution yet. I know Crystal has um, a pyrotechnic program, the volunteer pyrotechnic program. We looked at that, but haven't come up with sufficient volunteers. So that's one of our concerns is, how are we gonna protect the lake in the fall? Do we need to? Um, so far the evidence seems to be we don't. You know, it's going down very nicely despite no protection in the fall. But we kind of like to have all periods covered. Spring seems to be nature's covering it, summer we're covering it, but we're vulnerable to fall if there's a large flock of brigandsers that comes in and decides to make it positive. Denny, nobody asked you about if you have two lakes or three lakes that are doing this, if it proves the fact that other lakes throughout the state or the neighboring states so decided to do this. At what point do you start to impact the liability? Of right, well, right. Murder. And that's that's I think one of the reasons. Yeah, one of the reasons that MISID really wants to find additional sites to release some answers and spread them out. You know, is that that was what your question is getting at? Or well, that's essentially, they are already going to impact the ecology of oh. the lake. Yeah, I mean that you're, you are you are removing a, a top predator. Uh, there are fish, other fish eating birds, so uh, um, you're, not really, you're not removing the only fish eating birds. So I think that's, that's a good thing. Yeah. I've seen some huge flocks of bobbleheads in our lake in the fall, so I'm not too worried about the minnows overpopulating. Two part question. Uh, what's the lifespan of uh, Stagnacoli? And if it's infected, will it retain the, the, uh, the uh, yeah. uh, I forget which one of the, it was, the micro or mycadium. Will that stay in that snail as long as it's alive and he will keep yes. that original source that he infected him, he'll retain that and keep spewing it out when, he, when the temperatures mm -hmm. change and, and whatnot. Yeah, so generally the lifespan of snail is one year. One year? Yeah, one year. But um, the, the largest mortality is when they've reached, they've reached maturity at the end of the summer, especially if warm water temperatures result, they'll die on them. But they reproduce in the meantime, so all, the, all their offspring are right behind them, getting bigger throughout the whole summer. But with that offspring, wouldn't retain that person. Now the offspring, no, they don't get it from their snail parents. They, they get it from the new roots that are on the lake shedding parasites. And that's that's how, if you use a known intervention, that's how it carries over from year to year. Is the young snails get infected, they keep that infection all through the fall and winter, and in the spring they're ready to, they're, they're producing parasites in the, in the, the new regantors on the lake. Right. 